what happened is I, I loved my, my job at the publishers, but um, I was processing other people's work all day and doing what photography I could, and I really wanted to get out on my own, you know, and be the producer, not just the refiner. And um, so I talked to, in those days, there were agencies in New York that had photographers placed all over the world. Something happened, they would call you, they'd send you assignments. It wasn't like today's parachute journalists who suddenly rush in when something happens. You'd stay there, and this, this uh, one photo agent said she needed somebody in Beirut. And I said, yes, I'll go immediately. I knew nothing about Middle East, Beirut, anything, so off I went. And uh, so I wanted to read about that. I'm, re I'm telling you this in chronological order and I have to tell you, the book it, it takes poetic license and uh, does not go in chronological order. Thank you very much. The title of this uh, section is The Uncharted. I had to learn quickly when I arrived in Beirut in the autumn of 64. I had little prior knowledge of Middle Eastern peoples and places, history and civilizations. When a New York photo agency who served journalistic and corporate clients said they needed someone in that part of the world, I quickly volunteered. Amid the flurry of getting press credentials and finding an apartment, I met a seasoned Middle Eastern hand, the New York Times bureau chief, Dana Adam Schmidt. Twice my age, Dana had pounded the unpaved paths and tiled courtyards of the Arab world for decades. He said, Listen, next week I'm leaving for Cairo, then via an Egyptian military plane to Yemen where a civil, civil war is on. After that, by Land Rover, south across the South Arabian Desert via some British bases to Aden. The Brits are putting on an election there, a final outpost to their former empire east of Suez. Do you want to come? <laughs> yes, I blared it. <laughs> I bought film and did some hasty research at the Library of the American University of Beirut. I read a sociological study saying that relationships in this part of the world, personal and political, were mainly governed by sectarian affinities and hostilities, tribal and religious subgroups. It was a lesson reinforced often and starkly in the coming two years, one the Brits had already learned, but which it would take Washington another painful half century to begin to comprehend. To a budding photojournalist, Cairo was an ancient, busy, sophisticated wonder, but the towns and back roads of Yemen seemed a slice of life that had fallen outside of time altogether. The vitality of the men's faces in the mornings, I never saw a woman's face, melted to a semi-stupor in the afternoons as most males reverted to chewing a locally grown narcotic called gat. In this remote future tinderbox, world powers are already vying for hearts and minds. The Americans and Soviets were competing to build roads. I even grabbed a few shots of uniformed Chinese laborers digging the tough earth with pickaxes before being chased away. The Chinese at that stage had no money whatsoever, so they sent labor all the way from China to Yemen. Hearts and minds. Accompanying Dana Schmidt through the deserts and canyons and on interviews with folks of every type from the president on down was an education in itself. I remember he said, well, we're gonna go interview the president today. And I looked at my shoes, they were covered with dust. And I have to get a shoe shine, we're gonna look, see them. He looked at me like, where do you come from? There's no shoe shine around here. <laughs> Uh, but as we got to know each other, Dana revealed de details and contacts involved in his historic reporting on another even hard to reach people, the Kurds of northern Iraq. That's the kind of thing that print journalists are not going to tell each other, but they'll tell a photographer if you get to be a good friend of his because you're not competition. I cabled my agent asking if anybody wanted a picture story from there. She cabled an assignment from Life, a big break. Officially, it was impossible to get to northern Iraq because of the interminable warfare between the Kurds and the Baghdad government. But the following spring, a network of covert contacts got me there. This involved flying to Iran, then a U.S. ally, and fording the river border to Iraq at night, dressed as a Kurdish nomad riding on a donkey. 
It was a glorious adventure traveling on foot for a month with bands of spirited Peshmerga guerrillas guided mainly by a former Iraqi colonel who spoke good, good English. The result was a six-page story that helped establish me professionally. This was actually Cairo on the way. That little twig in his hat is got, you know, they, in case they might be in a place where they couldn't get it suddenly, they carry it around their hat. That's the, 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 the narcotic plant I'm talking about. Again, the attention to black and white details, that I think the, the umbrella is what makes the picture. That's a Chinese laborer. <coughs> and this is a kid on a building site. This is one of the pictures that Getty showed recently. But museums are funny, you know. I, I have much better prints of it than I made then at the time. I had a dark room in a, in, a, in, in a bathroom that leaked light so I could only print at night and the prints would get creases and everything. Oh, I said, I can make great prints of that now to the Getty. I said, I have a f two $15,000 enlargers. And, no, 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 we want the original one, the one on the, fell on the bathroom floor and that, and that makes it, you know, okay, but <laughs> that's their historical minded stuff instead of, you know, so they have it. Um, this is a, the, f the first class of girls who ever educated in Yemen. And uh, the Egyptians, it's a very complicated story, I won't go into it. The Egyptians were occupying Yemen at that point and they were having a civil war with the northerners who were as allied with, um, with Saudi Arabia. It was a proxy war such as we've heard a lot of in the Middle East for a long time. Anyhow. The Egyptians were, um, they considered themselves the, the, the purest Arabic, just as the Florentines consider they're the purest Italian, the purest Arab speakers and the most sophisticated people. And Nasser was fulminating about a lot of things, but claiming that they were bringing civilization to Yemen. So they took me proudly. I think this was the first class of girls to be educated there. but. All this, you, you, you take in this stuff and you kind of learn layers of lessons about different peoples, how they relate to each other, and how difficult it is for an outside power to intervene in this system. So now we're with the Kurds. And um, these, uh, I these, these guys, I really got along great with them. They, they're mountain people, completely unlike the desert people, and they have not heard of, uh, I mean, America had not heard of the Kurds at all, and it would be another half century before they were in the news here. But they were very, have their own language, they taught their schools themselves in Kurdish. It's an ancient country that's been divided between Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria. This was made by British uh, people drawing lines on the maps in a drawing room in England somewhere. It had nothing to do with the tribal con constituency, and we've all been living with it for a long time. But they make common cause with each other across f three or four borders, and all the uh, host governments hate them because they don't, because they're all shaky and they. Turkey wants to be united, Iraq wants to be united, it's subdivided in many ways, but the people themselves, isolated in the mountains, are just terrific. And this, this guy in the middle is Mustafa Barzani. He was the, one of the, the, the leaders of the Kurdish rebellion, which is a rebellion of hundreds of years, but um, I met him by a series of I was supposed to meet him, and then I was led to one place, and then they said, wait here, and then I led to another place, and about five places later, I finally came around the corner, and there he was. This is their system of, of protection, because there was a price on his head. He was uh, quite a guy, and his son is now um, 
one of the leading figures in Iraq. One of the nice things about the U.S. Uh, invasion of Iraq, there are other not nice things, but the Kurds have gotten a pretty sh good deal out of it. Anyway, these are the guys I was walking around with for all those weeks. And um, um, the, the one in front is the colonel who spoke English. It would have been pretty tough if there had been somebody who, who knew English. That's the colonel on the left and one of his men there working at night uh, on a map. They said there's a police station down there and we have our eye on it. There's several police inside. They sleep there every night. It's completely isolated. This is Baghdad police. And you're not getting any action pictures. So how about this? You come with us and for your benefit, we will we'll attack the station, kill everybody in it. You'll, you'll go home with a lot of great pictures. And, you know, it's kind of not in their vibe to say no, exactly, you know, you're either guest and they're, uh, you have to find some way, I, I found a way, I said my flash broke. <laughs> they said okay, but, you know, this is an example of journalism affecting history instead of the way it's you're supposed to be reporting on history, not creating history. That's a kind of uh, rough overt example, but the thing, that kind of thing comes up a lot. I mean, I was later, um, for two years running, I was invited to go to Bethlehem for an American Middle West magazine to f photograph Christmas in Bethlehem. Fine. So, I mean, I knew exactly what they wanted, you know, nice candlelit pilgrims and so forth. And what you got there, there was a territorial dispute about the, the birthplace of Jesus in this, in the holy sepulcher, not the sepulcher, but the birthplace. And some group of Eastern Orthodox monks were physically fighting with the other monks and they were on the roof throwing bottles down at them. <laughs> and meanwhile, the, the Jews are coming in on one side and the pilgrims from America are coming in on the other side and it's all happening at the same time. And so, I, I did my job, which is to get pictures that this, the magazine would want. And, uh, but that was, that was a subtler kind of filtering that you use as, as, a, as a photojournalist or as a journalist. And these things get built into your system. It's hard enough just to get there and to get the assignments. And um, it it's a, becomes a kind of a philosophical problem. What is reality, really? And you, you sometimes wonder. This is a Kurdish Peshmerga just resting in a, in a cafe. And I, I like the guys at, uh, behind him as much as him. This, the, they're largely nomadic people, at least at that time. And this is one of their shepherd boys. Um, and you find often that people have, that have really nothing. We would stay at villages. And there'd be a, a leather sack with some yogurt in it and maybe some bread, and that would be our food for the night or something. And the Kurds, the guys I was with, started taking pity on me, so they sent one of their soldiers out. It took him a week to come back, and he had two eggs for me. And, you know, the people that have nothing, they give you everything. And I found that many, many places, sleeping in mud huts or, or whatever. Uh, I was in a mud hut up there and the shelling began from Kirkuk, which is an oil town down at the bottom of the hills. The, Kur the Kurds had their eye on that. Anyway, the Iraqi government started shelling and the, one of the shells landed on the mud hut next to mine. And um, I did not sleep the rest of that night and I actually started thinking, um, is this really worth it? You know, it was not exactly fear. The fear is there, but I mean, there were guys going off to Vietnam in those days, plenty of guys getting killed as photographers there. And there's a certain daring do about war photography and I just decided I wasn't, I wasn't a war photographer. I had better things to do with my life. <laughs>